When is the last time you wore a suit? Might have been a year and a half ago. Why do you think you made it, Lloyd? Someone had to make it, and if it wasn't me, there'd be somebody else sitting in the seat talking to you. Lloyd, what were your thoughts when you saw people storm the Capitol? People are force-fed exactly what ratifies and validates their prior opinions. Cryptocurrency, are you a believer? You can't allow something to develop in this country where you don't know whether you're sending money to the North Koreans or Al-Qaeda. Hey family, Carlos Watson with a very special episode. I'm welcoming Lloyd Blankfein. Now, of course, he's a former CEO of Goldman Sachs, one of the best known CEOs in the world. And once upon a time, he was my boss. Now, I always enjoyed Lloyd, not only his brain, but I loved who he was. Lloyd was a white kid who started out in an almost all black high school, grew up in East New York, and still made it big. I think you're gonna enjoy his story, enjoy this conversation. The Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. You told me you were wearing a, uh, a work shirt and a jacket. This is like uh, the gift of the Magi. You went to look like me and I went to look like you. <laughs> Correct. You, we totally got the bad advice, but that's okay. You look good and, and I look like I look. I had to take the cobwebs off of this. <laughs> well, actually, when is the last time you wore a suit? Might have been a year and a half ago. Talk to me about how you got that job as CEO of Goldman. Um, because I think when people see someone where you are, CEO of one of the most prestigious companies, billionaire, you've done really well. I assume most people assume that you started off that way. My parents weren't well to do. My dad worked for the post office. I grew up in the projects. So to that extent, it was something that I wanted to get away from. But at the same time, I had an intact family and uh, friends who were also highly motivated. And so in some cases I was disadvantages in some cases I was advantaged. I did grow up in uh, public housing in New York City and I have some feel for it because you know I left there I left there three quarters of my life ago um, but it's amazing how that first quarter of your life really imprint, imprints you. Why do you think you made it Lloyd? Because a lot of your classmates probably didn't end up having the financial success. The, the disadvantage of being disadvantaged if you will is not that people can't make it it's that some will and a lot won't. And, you know, I was lucky at various points. I went to a distressed high school, but guess what? <laughs> I, had, I had the highest grades in that school and, um, and I, you know, against a, against a poor performing background, I looked pretty good and an Ivy League school took a risk on me and admitted me. I applied to a bunch of Ivy League schools. I didn't get into all of them. I got into that one. And then I went there, and then when I got there, I did well enough to get to the next level, and then I got a job on Wall Street, and I went this way and not that way. You know, you make a lot of your own luck, but you still, you know, there are people who can perform exactly way, and there are different outcomes for them. All the great things that came up my way, some of them were, you know, some of them I was lucky and helped by a lot of others. And, and I appreciate that, that you're open to giving that context. You know, tell us two or three things besides luck, good or bad. It helps to work really hard. It helps to have diverse interests. Somebody's working, if, if, if they're going home and reading um, you know, books on how to trade whatever or how to read research, whatever, and that's all they do, you're not gonna be an interesting pe person and people are not gonna wanna talk to you. And if they don't wanna talk to you, you're not gonna learn from them. I look for people who make, who make people around them better and not just people who are selfish being self-promoters. Uh, it's very important to keep, to get people who themselves will help recruit and retain other people because they're liked. You have to make an assessment about whether somebody could grow. Are they the kind of person that evolves or not? I like curious people. If people are, you could tell what people want to know from the questions they ask. You always have to keep growing. When you stop growing, you know, then, you, then you're on a shelf and you keep doing the same thing over and over again. is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully, dream fearlessly. Lynn, what were your thoughts when you saw people storm the Capitol? Let me, let me start by incorporating by reference about how horrible it was and shocking. I, I, I'm trying to get to what, I, you know, how did it happen and what did we learn? Let's not try to get back to where we were. Let's try to be better from this. And then what do we do? I think something else I learned that's analogous to some of my experience at my old job. I learned over time 
character overrides everything. That you have to have the discipline to give up someone who makes a lot of money for you, someone who also does very good at his job, if you don't trust the guy, or if he's a low character, or they might come close to the line of cheating in some way, even though you hadn't found it yet, but you worry about it. Because that bad character will always come out and will come out at the worst time. So I think for a lot of people in this country, Trump delivered what they wanted, even though they wouldn't want their children to go grow up and be like that. And maybe they said to themselves, look, while he himself is not living a pious life, he's the instrumentality of getting this good done, so I will vote for him. Maybe a lot of rich people who want to avoid paying taxes. Trump yep. was not misunderstood. We knew more about Trump when he got elected than we knew about anyone else because he'd been so active in the New York scene. Uh, he was a media star. We knew everything about him. We knew that there were character issues. We elected him, and I think the first go around, you could have the hope that the office would elevate the man. He got what got half the country the first election. By the time of the second election, we knew who he was and who he was going to be. And 75 million people voted for him. We clearly don't know the country. I mean, the country is, is, is split, uh, and each half of the country doesn't communicate with the other. You know, with social media, you go out and you look at three articles and Facebook or whatever the social medium you use will give you 300 more reinforcing articles with no risk that you'll get something you disagree with. People are, are spoon-fed, force-fed exactly what ratifies and validates their prior opinions. And so no one really engages with anyone else. And I think we have to study that and think as a country, what do we want to do? And I think we have to do certain things to make people engage with each other. I do think that there's an opportunity to almost say that, that there's a need to reset America, that there's almost a need for America 2.0. And what would be those ideas if you said kind of chapter one, it had a lot of good stuff in it in the first 250 years, but what do you need in order for kind of the second volume to be great? Like, I think there could be a fresh set of ideas. I'm not talking, you know, you sound like uh, my wife who, you know, wants to, uh redecorate everything, throw out everything and start from scratch. And I just want to like put a new tablecloth down. <laughs> I'm with Laura, uh, I'm, I'm with Laura, I'm, I'm with Laura, let's ready. go big. I'm not, ready. I'm not ready to throw everything that I've already paid for away and start fresh. <laughs> I, I, I think we need to make some adjustments. I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I, I think America has a lot of capacity to adapt and we have adapted. Another New Yorker, uh, AOC, has said we should make big changes in terms of economic policy. Are you all ready to make a ruckus? Are you all ready to fight for our rights? Are you all ready to say that in the United States of America, everyone is loved, everyone deserves justice, and everyone deserves equal protection and prosperity in our country? How do you hear that as someone who grew up in East New York, but has had an incredible ride and has incredible resources today. Is she right that the economic system doesn't fundamentally work for many, if not most people, and that we should make meaningful changes, not just little small incremental changes? I disagree with some aspects of it. I think, look, the heart is in the right place. Capitalism has been the greatest engine for economic development, and you have to create the wealth, but the capitalist system has done a much better job at creating it than distributing it. So I'm for more progressive tax system. I want more competent management. Okay, all right, all right you're, you're, you're more of an incrementalist, I'll take that. I just am not a banshee. Okay. I don't want to, I don't want to tear down the, I don't want to push away the columns and have the roof fall in. I think we have a lot to lose. If we were really an unsalvageable mess, I would agree with you. But I think we're a salvageable mess. All right, I want to go back to Goldman, where I once worked for you, uh, which now feels like long ago. Why do you think Goldman is so well known? It's funny, today when I look at Goldman's market cap, about $100 billion or so, is that right? right. And, we're, and right. we're now living in an era of the trillion dollar companies, whether it's Apple or Amazon or or others, and or or Tesla or what have you. Like why? It's, why driving, you, it's like driving up Park Avenue, and it's like driving up Park Avenue in New York. Yeah. You can't even find Grand Central Station, <laughs> which once loomed over everything, but now it's surrounded by skyscrapers. Yes, yes, and so 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 why is that? Why do you think? 
that while Goldman still has such, because if I think about maybe the 10 best known companies in the US, I feel like I would still put Goldman uh, in that. But, but why is Goldman a, a, a big but not a mammoth company, whereas these others have kind of taken off? Goldman, again, has businesses that are largely focused on high strategy and very focused on very high, very important biggest, you know, we advise the biggest companies. We do capital markets transactions, biggest transactions. We cover the highest net worth people. We deal with sovereigns. You know, with a number, you know, historically, Goldman's the number one firm in big M&A, number one firm usually in, equ you know, cap equity issuances. So all the activity in the core of Goldman doesn't have a lot of big processing businesses, doesn't have a lot of factory floors, doesn't have a lot of people moving inventories around. The cop Goldman is very, very concentrated in high profile, big significant strategic activities with highly with people that are highly leveraged and leverageable all right talk to me about bitcoin are you a believer if it works i could say look look at the history of the evolution of me of exchange medium you know you start out with gold physical currency you can bite into it and break your teeth and everything then over time instead of dealing in gold you deal in notes that represent ownership of gold and it turns out it just the paper stands on itself, but they still have the gold. Now they just issue paper and it's not backed by anything. The dollar's worth what the dollar's worth. Not the, the, government, the US government doesn't offer to exchange it for anything. The dollar has the value because you value it and I value it. So I could see that. If it doesn't work, the reason why it shouldn't work, which maybe gets overcome, is in this world where terrorists get funded and drug dealers have trade, you have to know the regulatory system appropriately requires intermediaries to know who you're paying. You can't allow something to develop in this country where you don't know whether you're sending money to the North Koreans or Al Qaeda. The whole core of essence of Bitcoin is that it's furtive, it's secret, you can't know. Complete freedom doesn't work where somebody uses that freedom to, to and has the capacity to blow us all up. One of the things that we talk a lot about on the show is how people realize their dreams, how they make things happen, even if often things aren't quite going your way, what you called you know, both good and bad luck. What's the best advice you've either given or gotten on that question of dreaming fearlessly? I would say one of the most important elements of a character to have is resiliency. I think you should dream, and if those dreams get deferred or unrealized or unrealizable, be resilient enough to, you know, okay, I'll move forward and, and, and keep going and, and, and keep amending and revising uh, your dreams. The most important thing is not the dream, it's having a dream and having a motivation. And the question of motivation and how lucky I thought some people were to have been motivated and needed, you know, to have need for money and therefore that was their motivation. Uh, it sounds an ironic thing to say. And it is, I've noticed in people that it is uh, sometimes burdensome to not only have to execute on motivation, but to source the motivation in the first place. Because if you're too comfortable and too, and life is too easy, and it's too attractive to go out and, you know, gamble in the fields, maybe you don't apply yourself as much, and in the long run, that's not, uh, that's not healthy for you. Not healthy for the spirit. One, one has to strive. I want to do a little rapid fire with you. Your favorite book of all time or one of your favorite books? I loved a book called A Distant Mirror. I, I, I just like those kind of books that kind of transport you and make you realize the worlds are different and how different this world that we're in that we take for granted will seem to somebody 400 years from now. Your favorite comedian? I guess I like listening to Seinfeld and Larry David. I like clever humor. Favorite place in the world you've ever visited? If I'm within 500 miles of Rome, I, I try to stop by for the history. Who, who would you love to meet, dead or alive, 
who you haven't met? Lincoln, because he was so wise and super confident without, without ego, it seemed. Lloyd, I love it. You're gonna have to keep coming back. You gotta promise me you're gonna keep coming back and visiting the show. This won't be the last time. I will tell you, as long as the commute, is as long as the reach to my computer in this uh, in this socially restricted, you know, world where we're all digital. You can have me anytime you want. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, I'm going to ask you to come back again, and uh, and I promise you, the commute won't be any worse. All right, hey, it's always great. I miss you. I miss you, Carlos. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Lloyd. What an interesting person. Maybe what an unlikely winner uh, in many ways. I know in some ways he may seem obvious, but in a lot of ways not. Really appreciated his candor, always loved his humor. Interesting to hear him say that sometimes you give up on super talented people who don't have the right character. Hey, hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, remember you can get more of it. Subscribe, tell good people about it as well. And of course, the beauty of it all, the podcast. Try the podcast, it's the whole deal. You'll enjoy it, I'll see you soon.